will be called to order, and the first order of business is to approve the minutes of March 28th. Are there any amendments to be offered? Uh, I have two concerns on page four, one on line two. That Mr. Mustafi asked that the proposed structure would go in front of the planning board. But it strikes me that they're putting a structure in front of the planning board. Maybe the, the proposal. I'm sorry, can you state again where you're uh, referring page to? Page four, line two. It, the way it reads, I, it took me, struck me as asking if the proposed structure would go in front of the planning board. It sounds like they're putting a physical object in front of the planning board in a spatial relationship. Uh, I would suggest we change that to proposal. And then on line 46, it says, Mr. Cronin said his concern was the ability for the board to apply conditional use restrictions on the application. I don't think I had a concern of our ability. I had a concern uh, for the conditional uses rego uh, restrictions regarding future expansion rather than the ability of the board. So you would reword that to yeah. say what? Yeah. In the board discussion, Mr. Cronin said that his concern uh, was conditional, reuse to conditional use restrictions uh, regarding future expansions. Okay, on, on those two on that page, are, are the members that were in attendance at that meeting and uh, accepting of those yes. as reflecting it? Okay. And are there others? Mr. Cronin? No. Do you have others? Are there any other concerns or amendments about the minutes? Uh, all in favor of the minutes as amended? All opposed? And minutes are approved. Next item is old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? I'm not aware of any. Mr. Smith, is there? Not that I'm aware of. And new business. And that is to hear the appeal of Anthony Taylor, Pro Style Design for Ronald and Kay Kramer, 21 Island View Road, tax map U030, lot 69, for a front property variance of four feet from the required 20 feet to construct dormer and porch addition. Is there someone here to speak in favor of that? Please come to the podium, identify yourself. My name is Ron Kramer. I'm the owner uh, with my wife, Kay Kramer, at 21 Island View. Tony Taylor will be making a presentation on my behalf uh, in terms of the uh, style and placement of the addition on the property. And I'll be available for any questions after that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. We'll, we'll need you to come to the podium. You're hopefully bringing it over. And again, for the record, please identify yourself at the microphone. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Tony Taylor of Postal Design in Portland. I guess I would like to uh, address each of the uh, criteria in order. So, uh, with the aid of these pictures. For, for the board members, you'll need to move it a little bit to, towards the podium. It might work best if I hold it up and point to the relevant sections here. Okay. Now, on, on point number one, um, land in question cannot uh, yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. This is the present appearance of the house here, and uh, you will see that uh, in comparison with this house, uh, two blocks, uh, two houses down, it lacks a central feature on the third floor level, and there's a, a master suite has been created here on the third floor level, uh, which has windows only on the two sides, not in, in the front or the rear. There are two skylights here. And, uh, you know, people who uh, purchase a home sometimes find that uh, there are certain awkwardness of, of things. There are 
there are uh, remodelings to be dealt with that were done. And in this case, the front section here over the door was added. And so the front has a, a rather uh, confused and truncated appearance compared with the, the architectural standard of the neighborhood. It lacks a central feature, as I say. This, this down here is our design objective. This is uh, a colonial revival house in Worcester, Massachusetts, which uh, has a uh, full porch across the facade, a, a prominent central feature. And so the desire for ventilation and light on the, in the master suite, which the previous owners had created on the third floor, led to the necessity of creating a front facade on the third floor level over the uh, projection. Having, having considered that, the, uh, the aesthetic problem created here was met with the uh, front porch idea, which uh, counteracts the verticality of the central feature with a uh, horizontal grounding element. And so that's what ran into the, uh, the difficulty with the setback. Which uh, brings me to uh, point uh, two. The need for variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to general conditions in the neighborhood. And, and you refer to the uh, plot plan, which, which you have. These conditions are that the street runs on a diagonal around the front and the left side. And uh, this photograph here is taken quite even with the front facade of the house adjoining to the right. So we're right in plane with that. And it, it can be seen that the Kramer house is on an on average set back. And the effect is of spaciousness because of the, uh, the way that the the street wraps around it. We have on the right corner, we have a 36 foot from the uh, street, even from the proposed porch. In the center, we have a 32 foot uh, setback, even from the proposed front porch. And indeed, on the uh, extreme left side, where the street does come close to the Kramer house, we have an even 20 feet measured towards the front. It's only on the diagonal measure that the, uh, it, it falls within the 20 foot uh, limit and is uh, 16 feet. By way of comparison, and this, as you know, is a horseshoe drive. It comes out as sea view on the other side. Directly behind the Kramer house is an existing house at uh, 8 Seaview. And, and it can be seen that it's almost a mirror image of the Kramer house. And uh, with the ex original porch, the diagonal measure is 14 feet from the, the street to the, the corner of the porch. And it can also be seen that the uh, configuration of the, the gabled dormer in the center, and then it's the first floor porch. It creates a setback effect, a, a stepped profile. Uh, and this is an open porch, and you can read the wall behind the porch, and the original structure is not obscured by uh, the porch, as it would be with an enclosed porch. So on, on point number three, the granting of a variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. And here's another view of the um, house and back at uh, 8 C view. And it can be seen the way the, the uh, street wraps around the porch, coming within 14 feet from this corner to, to here, uh, two feet less than what we're requesting for uh, the uh, Kramer House. In fact, the uh, proposed alterations will render the house more in keeping with the architectural character of the 
neighborhood. In, indeed, the, uh, the form for the porch was suggested by this example, uh, two houses down at uh, 11 Island View with the uh, projecting pedimented entry in the center of the uh, four-column four porch. So the, uh, the applicant, having purchased a house last December, is only seeks to uh, <clears throat> make it more livable and to make it more aesthetically attractive in keeping with the character of the street and the neighborhood. And we have received a, uh, a letter, which was sent to the uh, code enforcement officer in support of this from a owner of a house on the same street. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Are there any questions from the board of Mr. Taylor at this time? Uh, Mr. Prestat. What you're proposing is extremely attractive and, and it does kind of blend in with what's in the neighborhood. My question is, how did you establish the setbacks? Well, I had a 100-foot tape measure, and I measured from the uh, edge of the pavement to uh, the base of the structure. And I also measured out from the structure uh, to the dimensions of the proposed front porch, which are outlined here in yellow tape. So okay. I, if I'd like to pass these out if you'd like to see how the yellow tape uh, affects the... Uh, so you don't know what the width of the, what the road was? You don't know where the setback on the, uh, uh, or the right-of-way is? And this wasn't a professional engineer establishing any setbacks. I, I drove by there three times um, because I had some concerns about how close it actually was to the road, and, and I looked at what you're proposing, and I'm saying, boy, that... It doesn't look like there's a, that's a setback from the right of way. My concern is that if we, if we act on this this evening and you go and do some work and you do a mortgage survey down the road and you find that the actual property line is shorter than this, someone's going to be in trouble. I, I have, and, and this is something that I've been advocating since I've been on the board. When people come before us for a for a variance, it's, it's awful good to have, in the other hand, a copy of a survey done by, that's a, a mortgage survey? Is that what you're referring to, Bruce? That's all the board requires. Although, it, I just notice it doesn't match what he had. Oop, I, that's, that's the issue. Well, I, assumed, I'm, I assumed he'd scaled out from here. I got yeah. his measurements. I didn't compare well, my concern is My concern is that your measurements aren't accurate. And if they are inaccurate and they're, you know, it's shorter than the, than the variance we're giving you, and you go ahead and spend this money, then, as I say, it's going to be a problem down the road. Um, For the record, um, Mr. Smith, could you describe what the documents are that you've reviewed about the measurements, just to be clear on as the record? As required by, by the Board of Appeals, um, the mortgage inspection was submitted. Um, I didn't review the mortgage inspection, but I didn't transpose the same measurements over. I, I made the assumption that that had been done by the applicant, and I see that, that they are somewhat different now. Um, what you're saying, Mr. Smith, is they don't coincide with what's being presented before us this evening? They seem to be a discrepancy? Discrepancy from the from the plan that the board requires of a mortgage inspection, correct? All right. Does the applicant understand what I, where I'm coming from, where not, what I'm saying? No. All right. If you want to get up to the podium, I'll explain it. You're presenting to us this evening certain setbacks 
from the road on this, on this scale here? That's correct. Okay. The road not necessarily, or is not necessarily the actual right of way. Normally your road is wider than the paved area, and it could be five feet, it could be 10 feet. So the, the variance that you're asking for is to the paved, the pavement, and in reality, the right of way is wider than the paved area. So it's, you're not asking for 16 feet or, or, or 19 feet, you're asking maybe for 11 feet or for 14 feet. My suggestion is to get a survey to, to, to verify, and this is a difficult one because it is on the corner, but I mean, you, you can take the chance and, and, and continue this evening, but, but my concern is it's actually less distance from your proposed porch to the street right of way. It's not 16 feet, it's closer to 10 feet. I mean, that's, that's my feelings, and, and, and I'm concerned about what we're going to be asked to vote on this evening, and, and I would certainly like to see something that shows where the right of way is in the street. I looked at it, and as I said, three times, and I, and I, and I looked at, at where it is now in the house, and then if you're adding the porch, it's going to be closer to the road than what's there. And that's why I was alarmed by the 16 feet, and I and I just I basically I distrust that that measurement. But that's my feeling. There's, there's six other people here tonight, and, and I I had a concern with the house behind you when they came to ask us for a variance and how close it was to the road. And I'm reiterating my concern at this that evening. Was, that was in regards to their moving of the garage, wasn't that? Was that the yeah, I think it was. I think it was the garage area. That was. A year and a half ago, two years ago. Yeah, I but I'm still concerned about the actual distance. There may be other other questions from board members from either Mr. T for either Mr. Taylor or Mr. Kramer, and this would be an appropriate time to ask them. Are there other questions? Yeah, I, I think that um, Mr. Fastashi was mentioning this. I want to come back to this point too. It seems there is a discrepancy between these two plans. Um, Whereas the mortgage inspection plan is showing in 19 feet from the corner of the house to to whatever the um, whatever that curve line represents, whether it's the pavement or the actual right of way, and the blueprint here shows, I would guess, something like maybe 22, 23 feet. So it's since we're dealing with a case of a few feet being applied for, we have a few feet discrepancy here. And, and I am concerned about the fact we don't know what we really have in front of us in terms of what we're being asked to approve. Well, I, I, if I could comment, and I, and I appreciate the, the specificity required in, in, yeah. these, in, these, um, in these issues. I think ultimately we're, we're you know, without, and again, I'm, this is not my area of expertise. Um, ultimately, we're looking for an appropriate variance to enhance the house to to essentially add you know beautify it make it a better uh, a better place and we I will tell you informally we've got a lot of great feedback from our neighbors are there other implications that if we did this that it would not be appropriate if we went to sell it sometime is that the issue no, I, I agree with Mr. Stashi's opening comments that it's a very attractive design addition to the house and it, it certainly um, improves the character of the house in terms of making it more consistent with the character of the rest of the neighborhood. But the, and so we admire that part of it. We don't have any complaints about that or any concerns about that. But we do have to operate by a set of rules and by, by formal fact-finding in terms of approval and application. And I think that there's at least two levels of ambiguity here as to what the numbers really are that we're being asked to approve. Maybe Tony can clarify that. Yeah, well, I, I understand your concern. My, I will just comment upon the uh, discrepancy in, in what I make of it. The, the mortgage document is, is not that, that formal a document, and uh, I, I went out with my tape and attempted to create a more accurate document, uh, nor am I a professional engineer, and I don't uh, pretend to be. But to satisfy my own curiosity, I went out with a tape and did the best I could, and I've measured buildings 
for architects in Boston where we had to locate all the uh, peers in the basement where they that had an application. So I've got a lot of surveying experience. And uh, this could be verified in the field or a professional person such as yourself could do some fact finding and uh, how could uh, how could we find out where the right of way is? Is that a, a matter of city record here? How wide the street is? Uh, anyway, maybe are you suggesting that we get a professional engineer survey to make a more accurate document before this we proceed with this? There, there may be before that question gets answered. There are, are there other issues to discuss with the applicant and and Mr. I do Taylor? Have one question. Um, I know that you've defined in the attachment and answer 9A um, how the land cannot yield a reasonable return without the variance. But as far as I understand it, the, the reasonable return aspect of this request is to allow the, ma the master suite to be expanded. If that really doesn't have much to do with the porch, my question for you is how does the porch fit into that reasonable return? Wow. Yes, well, I'll look at it this way. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that to add the dormer to the master suite on its own would, would create a disproportion which can be balanced by adding the porch. It's like a cross. You have the vertical arm of the cross being the uh, central projection of the house and with its dormer extending a little higher. And the, the horizontal arm of the cross is the porch. And that balances it by adding a horizontal accent to the front of the house. And this is quite a, a distinguished street with uh, houses of this caliber. And uh, there, is a, there is an attempt at balance of horizontal and, and vertical. And so adding the dormer brings out the need for the the porch because it brings it, it ratchets, ratchets up your expectations to a level where something more is, is expected. It's like wearing a beautiful shirt and no pants, you know? You, you have to balance it out so that you don't look poor in one area and rich in another to create a unified whole as, it, as, it, as, you, as you see from the facade. Because this is what we've got right here and this is the aim, this is the design model. Something, something balanced, harmonious, and uh, sumptuous. I can't help but notice, though, in the picture you are referring to in the top left-hand corner, there is a dormer on the side of the house, and then that would be the same height if it would not. And that side doesn't have a porch, but that's the top picture. And this the doesn't have a porch. Well, the, the difference is that we have a projection here of the center. And you see, that's the thing about this porch, is that in a way, adding the porch on a straight line, or almost a straight line, helps to soften the angularity of this projection in the center, which is quite awkward in its, in its appearance, in being flat at the top. And so, so you've got a six-foot projection here and an eight-foot porch. So it's enveloped and softened, and it's less of a protrusion on the first floor level because it's enclosed and enveloped in that porch. Um, your need for a variance would go away, I, at least based if we applied the measurements in this diagram, if the porch didn't extend quite to the edge of the house, that would still accomplish the objective that you want in terms of enveloping the projection of the house. Right. Uh, but we, we are dealing with some, some real-time constraints here, which I'll refer to the facade drawing to point out why that's we're up against here. The front of the house is the side that faces the south. And at first, when, when a porch was discussed, uh, the Kramers were very adverse to roofing this out. Because as you know, in the, in the, uh, in the winter time, we really treasure those, that side of the house, the south side, the sun comes in the windows. To, uh, to overcome that objection, we come up with the idea of two foot by six foot skylights placed between the rafters, and it's an open rafter roof, allowing the light to come in. Because here we have a, a, a triple window of a combined 
house <coughs> is eight feet. That's a real treasure on the south side of the house to give that up. So, in spacing out the rafters to uh, accommodate four of these two by six foot skylights, the symmetry of it required that, uh, well, we got uh, rafters every two feet uh, across the width of the skylights, and then the, the interval goes to 18 inches, so you have three in a row. You have a certain rhythm set up of the, uh, of the rafters. Four widely spaced ones and, and three shortly spaced ones. And so once we got locked into those requirements, the skylights, the sen skylights centered over the window, that uh, the, the, the harmoniousness of it dictated the outcome of the design, have everything in harmony. Other questions from board members? Mr. Cronin. Uh, I'm having trouble ident figuring out, the, 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 you're saying the hardship is basically then aesthetic. It, yeah. it, it doesn't, are, are you acknowledging that the house can yield a reasonable return, that it will yield a better return if it were more aesthetically pleasing or the town cannot, or are you arguing that the house cannot yield a reasonable return because it's, it's not adequately aesthetic? Well, what I, what I mean, it is similar in dimensions to uh, the, the standard of the neighborhood. It is similar in, in the volume it encloses. It really has no, not much character on the outside compared with the neighborhood standard. We have quite a, an interesting amount of architectural expression, which often takes the form of a porch across the full width of the facade. That's, that's notable right across the street. In, in at least five houses within eyesight, standing on the front porch, have this type. Uh, standing on the front yard, you can see about five or six examples of the house with the uh, front porch across the front. So to have a house of a, of a considerable cubic uh, volume and yet be constrained from uh, embellishing it up to the neighborhood standard, then it is not really reaching its potential, the potential that it has to take its place in the community uh, as equal to the neighborhood standard. And in, in this neighborhood, the houses are they're relatively close together and they uh, are relatively close to the road. And yeah, I, I, I mean, I looked at the property, I, I, and that's my conclusion, too. Uh, and the town, in its wisdom, uh, the town council uh, passed certain ordinances on, on setback from roads to prevent that from happening, but allowed exceptions on, on the grounds of reasonable return. And I guess my question is, I, I don't understand. I, I, I'm sympathetic to you, uh, to your right to go up. I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't, I, I have not got a sense of justification why it's a hardship not to be able to go out. And what I've heard from you so far is you tell me that it's aesthetic and uh, that doesn't meet my standards for a hardship. And what can you, I'm asking you, do anything, can you tell me anything to convince me that this is a genuine hardship. And in well, fact, the, 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 in, in the, fact, and, and yeah. another consideration is that it, it further makes the neighborhood, I don't want to say, uh, more exp, uh, ex expansive. It takes up uh, areas that seem to, are already tightly packed and makes them, puts more on, uh, reduces the setbacks even more. and. Uh, which to me is less aesthetic than having houses with uh, even to the maximum setbacks they have now. So that's my problem. Well, uh, you know, uh, well to answer uh, your question, uh, there are two objectives to this remodeling. One is the livability and the other is aesthetic, and hopefully a skillful design will, will coincidentally meet both objectives. So the, the objective of livability is met by pushing up and uh, creating the dormer. The objective of aesthetics is really the Kramer's gift to the street, to the community. There's an outward display of, of 
some uh, uh, and the neighborhood is, a, is a, almost a conversation. The front of a house and the, what you put forth on the front of the house is uh, the way you wish to be perceived. <coughs> and it is uh, dealing with the present appearance of the house, the, uh, a great deal of the thought went into it was to uh, meet the uh, aesthetic objectives. And the aesthetic objectives was to deal with the awkwardness of the present facade, the ungainly projection in the center uh, with, its, with its flat roof, the utter lack of embellishment, and uh, certainly the, when you look around the neighborhood, there are many examples provided for us in the form of the other houses suggesting ways to uh, make this building uh, seem a part of the, the architectural uh, vocabulary of M this area. Mr. Taylor, uh, yeah. um, Mr. Kramer, I think, has something else to add along those lines. And then I think uh, we've talked about this quite a bit. There may be some other areas of, um, of interest that we'd like to talk about. So please respond, and then we'll see if there are other questions. Well, uh, we, uh, my wife and I, did some research in the house, and. We understand that this was the first tract house, of, uh, tract neighborhood approved in 1928. In fact, I have a photograph, an aerial photograph of this neighborhood from 1928. Um, when we did some research, this, of all the homes in the neighborhood I refer to, is, um, is probably the runt of the litter if you were to look at them. Uh, but we, we've been looking in the area for almost three years, and we saw uh, we felt uh, as a home that you know certainly could be uh, uh, brought up to the standard of or what we felt with the standard of all the other homes in the neighborhood as well. Um, the skylights we felt were very unattractive, as you can see on the on the top of the roof line. It really didn't blend in. Therefore, that's why we we felt that the dormer um, would be appropriate to take the skylights away and at least uh, incorporate it into the overall design. In terms of the porch. Um, we, we asked Tony to do research, to research uh, um, homes of that era and so forth, and a lot of thought and planning has gone into deciding to put a porch on and, and so forth, not only just for the aesthetics, but because of my wife and I and the family would like to enjoy the front of the house and be able to socialize with our neighbors, um, and it is kind of limited. Um, in terms of the way the house is laid out in, in that aspect. Um, my only final comment would be that we are trying to enhance the house to beautify, help beautify the neighborhood. We're you know, planning to invest a lot of money into this project, which we would like to do. Uh, we understand that it is a matter of a few feet here, and if it, uh, the board would, uh, would, uh, would consider what we're, we're trying to accomplish here and, and understanding that you have guidelines to follow, that we are trying to do the, the right thing here with every, taking everything into, in, in, into, into account. And I want to give Tony a lot of credit. He spent a lot of time and a lot of research to make sure that this was uh, a design that would hopefully be complementary to the board, as well as Kay and I and our neighbors. And we, we've, we've, done a, we've tried to do a lot of homework and make sure that this was appropriate. And those are, that's about all. I just have one other question. Will the dormer obstruct anybody's uh, view of the uh, Portland uh, Harbor entrance. The dormer will not, not that, not that I, not that I could see, because the peak of the we have a widow's walk that's, a, that's still going to be above where the the dormer's roof line. So the dormer will cut into the front of the right here. Right, and there's nobody yeah. to the right of us. It's Are there other questions on the board? I have a question for the code enforcement officer. Uh, I'm on page 65, Bruce. I, I need a clarification on this. Um, call it line 12 or section 12. Front yard setback. And it said that the, um, I was skipping down to the last, sen last uh, sentence but any structure must be at least 20 feet from the right of way. Now, we can reduce it down to a maximum 
or excuse me, a minimum of 20 feet from the right of way? Is that what that, that language means? What that means is that, that if, if you take the average of the two principal structures in close proximity, that you can be as close as those two, as the average of those two, but no less than 20 feet. No That's less. all that's saying. And then when it's less than 20, they have to come before us? Is that what it is? Well, if they fit into that category, all right. and it's less than 20. <coughs> all right. Where does he fit here? Does he, he fit in this category? Makes no difference. He still need he still he still needs a variance because he's less than the required 30 feet. Okay. What can we what? 30 feet or 20. What is the maximum variance we can give him on a front setback? There isn't anything in the ordinance that that, that, we, that we dictate can to, what the maximum variance would be. Okay. All right. That was one question. The other question is. Is there a, a maximum amount of area a house can, can cover on a lot? Yes. And what is that percentage? That's uh, in that zone on public sewer, it's 25%. All right. Has anyone done the calculating to see? Yes, we have. All right. And what, what do we have for a percentage on this? I don't have those figures available, but I, I do know that that, that, that that was worked out with the garage being removed. They've got an addition that they've added onto the back. Um, and I don't have the figures available in front of me, but I wouldn't issue a permit without checking that out anyways. Okay, it's, it appears close. I've done, I don't have any measurements on the house, but I, it, it appears real close to 25%. If I don't not- have building, I don't have the building permit application in front of me. Here. Yeah. I, I can't come up with an accurate number because I don't have the dimensions on the house and the porches. But I, I mean, it's, it's another concern that I have. The porch coverage with the removal of the garage uh, fits within the 25%. I can tell you that much. I don't know the figures, but I can tell you it does fit within 25%. We're still in the, in the open public hearing part of, of this case, and I'll ask the board, give the board one more. Uh, round to see are there any other questions of Mr. Kramer or Mr. Um, Taylor and then we'll ask if there's any other I have public one more question and again um, I apologize this is one of the, the questions again on the, the application I'm referring to 9b um, in your discussions tonight you've often referred to the other houses in the neighborhood and how this would actually fit in the scheme but as you know the, the factor that we are considering is why this property is unique and not because of the general condition of the property, the neighborhood. So I'm looking at the, the lot, um, the surrounding lot. I see that there are a lot of houses, in fact, on corners with different um, front yard setbacks. So my question now is, why is this house so different than the other house similarly situated in, in the neighborhood? What's, uh, what's different about it is that, that the, it's the gradual nature of the curve that uh, cuts the corner right off the, uh, around the property. It, most corners are, are more rectangular with a, maybe a small curve at the, uh, at the outer corner. It's, it sweeps uh, around the house this way and uh, it, it shares that characteristic with the house behind it, which I pointed out there or there. So it's, it's in a class of its own because of the the shape of the lot and the way the street runs around it. And Thank you. In any, fact, yeah. Any other questions while he's up there? I'm sorry, you were about to point and just out look one. at this picture here to, to give you the impression of the, the effect, even though it comes close at one corner, the, the average net setback effect from the street is substantial due to the fact that it's way more on the, on the right side. You have, uh, well, 36 feet on the right side. So if you average out 36 and, and uh, 16 or, eight or 20 or, or 18, it, the general impression given, on a, whereas the, the house is not uh, parallel to the uh, curb line, and you have to look at the area in front of the house and see if that gives an impression of spaciousness. And does this uh, detract from the impression of spaciousness in the neighborhood? Well, I would maintain, that's why I put the yellow tape on and took these photographs, is you already have a central projection of six feet. 
and a porch projection of eight feet is just two more feet than, than six feet. Where it runs into the uh, setback is just at the corner, of course, because there isn't anything at the corner right now. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. And we'll now ask if there are any other members of the public who wish to speak on this application. There being none and there being no other questions from the board, we'll close the public hearing and now have a discussion on the board. And I will remind board members before we have that discussion that at a meeting um, two months ago, a workshop meeting, we discussed that we would like to operate in the fashion of having general discussion on the board before we make motions one way or another on any subpart or whole so that we're <coughs> understanding what issues uh, are before us as fully as possible before we're committed to making a motion or taking a vote. But after that, we will then look at the application and look at the four conditions which each must be met um, in order for us to grant this variance. And we will following the conclusion of our discussion, move to look at each of the four conclusions to see what conclusions we can make about this. And all four must be satisfied in order for us to approve a variance. And that's how we'll conduct our, our uh, discussions now. So we're open for discussion. Mr. Keneally. Bruce, do you have any information that would help us as far as how much the right of way extends beyond the paving in this neighborhood? I do not, but I would like to comment on that particular issue if I could. Appreciate it. I, yeah. And this is just a comment that the board may already be aware of, uh, that, that I'm not sure that it's relevant whether it's 16 or 12 until you establish whether the hardship criteria is met, and then maybe that's a relative point. But irregardless of whether it's 16 or 12 or 10 feet, the hardship either exists or it doesn't. So I think if you establish that, that may, that may lead you in, in the right direction or maybe the wrong. Thanks. Mr. Fristacci. Well, I'm going to follow up Jack, where Jack was going, at least where I anticipate I'm going. Um, it's a concern of mine more so right now than the hardship, uh, whether whether we're looking at a, a 16 foot variance, a 19 foot variance, or a 10 foot variance. Um, I, st I still have a concern about, about the distance to the, to the right of way. That's, that's my issue tonight. And, and, I, I, and, and, I, and I can appreciate uh, Mr. Kramer's concern about are there any other concerns that you have or other issues that you have. Um, And, but, but I would hate to see the board get in a predicament that you send them away without determining the hardship simply to come to explain the project or you write the variance based on the closest point. Um, so you, you're not necessarily concerned with, well, you are concerned in overall, but if you scale it out, they probably wouldn't be here if the porch wasn't the issue. Okay. Then, then the other... Um the other concern that we're talking about and around a little bit is is the hardship issue. Is there, is this a hardship, or it doesn't meet the hardship criteria, or doesn't it? And I think we should have some discussion about that on the board. Well, I, I, I tend to agree with what Joe said. Um, I understand what you're saying, Bruce, about hardship should come first. Um, I'm not sure that most most applicants really understand the way we are required to operate. Um, the four things that we're talking about here are not guidelines, they're actually criteria. And the zoning board has to operate in a quasi-judicial manner. You can't do formal fact-finding relative to those criteria. So it's not just rough guidelines. Um, we have in the past um, approved variances where uh, there's a situation like this where we knew it was a very, very small intrusion on the, um, on the setback. And I think what Joe's point is getting at in response to Bruce's point is that we don't know this is a very small intrusion. If we were certain it was only a three-foot intrusion, then there is some elasticity, I think, in the way we do fact-finding. 
Um, but we don't really know whether it's a three-foot intrusion or a ten-foot intrusion here. But I, I, I still would, would question whether the land can yield a reasonable return at 16 feet but not at 8 feet. I, I still question what the difference is between the two. The measurements from a property line, whether it be 8 or 16, has nothing to do no, with I, the fact that the four hardship criteria has to be met. No, I, I hear what you're saying. And, and ideally, I mean, we are we're guided by town council to apply these criteria in a black and white way in as much as possible. But there are many situations that we don't treat truly black and white. There's an area of gray in there. I'm not, and I'm, and I'm not, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying, Jack. What I'm trying to understand is what the difference would be, whether it's, whether it's one measure or another. Would that change the conclusions? Well, the and question, if it would, then, then fine. But. The, qu the question that you're raising is about the reasonable return criteria. And does this meet that criteria? And I haven't I'm heard any discussion about that. Um, a little blurb about reasonable return standard and how the courts in Maine have construed it. And it says the courts made it clear that reasonable return does not equal the maximum return. It is extremely difficult for an applicant to prove that he or she cannot realize a reasonable return, that there's no other permitted use can be conducted to realize such a return. And just based on those three cases cited here, I throw it out. Do people think that the reasonable return has, um, cannot be met without this porch? Yes, Mr. Backer. Um, I'd like to respond to that. Um, with some reluctance, I'd like to respond to it. Um, and I think I'd like to address my comment in some respect directly to Mr. Taylor and Mr. Kramer to say, first, Mr. Taylor, I think your presentation was excellent. Um, I think your design um, is outstanding. To use your word, I think it's sumptuous. I think it creates, I mean, if I was a neighbor, across the street or next door, I think it would be a wonderful um, addition to the house and to the neighborhood. Um, I'm troubled as a board member. I was troubled when I reviewed this application before I even heard the presentation. Um, but listening uh, today, um, it seems to me that I'm feeling terribly constrained by the rules that we have to operate under and the fact that the town council has not yet adopted the practical difficulty test, correct? That's right. We are still operating with these, these criteria that are regulations. And to elaborate on uh, my comment, what I mean, and to follow up on Catherine's comment, the um, undue hardship test that has been uh, tested a number of times in the main uh, Supreme Judicial Court makes it very difficult to meet the standard uh, required to obtain a variance in this kind of a situation. Um, and I, I was, I think, during your presentation, Mr. Taylor, I was reading uh, the same paragraph that Catherine just read to us. Um, the next sentence is even more devastating. Uh, to the application. Um, and it says the typical request for a setback variance uh, to allow an addition to an existing structure <coughs> will have to be denied on the basis of the reasonable return standard, absent proof that the person has tried to sell the property as is, and no one will buy it unless the proposed construction can occur. Well, you certainly haven't established that, nor do I think could you. Um, there was a case that we're all familiar with that came out of um, the main Supreme Judicial Court just about exactly a year ago. Um, Roe versus the city of South Portland, and it's one that you may be familiar with, where somebody built a 4,600 square foot new home, um, I think on the ocean, um, and the contractor, in the process of setting out 
the uh, boundaries of the house, thought he'd do the homeowner a favor and move it back just a little bit uh, because of concern from erosion, and ended up creating an invasion on the setback of less than two feet. And um, the owner tried to get a variance, and it was denied, and the main Supreme Judicial Court upheld the denial and said that the city of South Portland couldn't grant a variance um, because there wasn't proof that the house didn't have some value, even if they chopped that corner off or rebuilt it or went to incredible expense to fix it. Um, the point being that what the law says is that Failure to yield a reasonable return means the practical loss of all beneficial use of the land. And certainly the Kramers have beneficial use of the house. We as a board, I think, feel foolish having to say to you, no, you can't put on this nice addition to improve the neighborhood, but the law doesn't permit us to, to grant the variance, as I read it. Um, you probably know that the council is considering adopting a different standard that would permit us to approve these kinds of variances. But until that happens, um, I'm inclined to agree with Catherine completely. Um, and I think that um, the undue hardship standard is going to stymie us from going any further. I mean, that's a, a long explanation, but I feel that it's necessary to explain sort of the agony that I've been feeling sitting here listening to this, thinking that you deserve to have the variance granted, but I don't know how we can do it, other than to ignore the fact that the ordinance says what it does. Thank you, both of you, for, for um, bringing forth um, reminders of the limitations of the law and the, and the regulations and, and what we making making very explicit what we struggle with in, in a variance request such as this. Is, are there other um, comments um, or? There, there is a certain degree of, of precedent in that the board has exercised <coughs> discretionary judgment. And I realize we, we have, if you follow the letter of the law, then you have to agree with Dave and Catherine that you, practically nobody will ever qualify for a variance. Uh, we have allowed de minimis, minimal adjustments uh, in setbacks to accommodate uh, proposals that would enhance the neighborhood, enhance the property. Uh, nobody has any objections to, doesn't, doesn't adver adversely affect the neighbors. Uh, the neighbors don't lose anything. And we, we sort of, to our uh, shame uh, sort of said, well, you know, it's not really, but let's just go along with it and read, read it and hem and haw about it and just vote on it. Uh, and that's the way the board generally has proceeded. Now, my problem now is, is this a minimal thing that we could just sort of hem and haw and say, well, okay, yeah, go ahead, it, because it has such a minimal impact, or does it have a, a substantial impact? And I can't vote for it until I know about the degree of impact. And so Bruce's question is, well, do you want to debate the issue of, of hardship? And I said, well, uh, if, it's, if it's really a minimal thing of two feet, well, maybe I'll sort of uh, close one eye and, uh, and cock my head sideways and look at it that way and, and vote for it. Or is it more than a minimal intrusion on the uh, uh, expansion of, of the setback, uh, of the uh, reduction in the setback? And I don't know what that, what that is now. I think, I think we may want some more discussion, but um, I, I was remiss in not um, making public for the record that the board members did receive a copy of one letter. And I will make that public on the record now of dated April 19th um, from Ellen and Jeff Van Fleet, who live at 18 Ocean View Road. Um, saying that they uh, would not be able to attend this hearing, but sent a letter in support of the effort to receive a variance. Um, so we'll enter that into the record. Right. Is there other discussion?
May I point out that if the board does not approve this tonight, that the, the applicant can't come back for a, a full year. Is that right, Bruce? With a similar import, and yeah. unless we change, unless the standards are changed to practical difficulty, and then they can go back under under practical difficulty standards. So that option is available if that passes. It, what is the status of the uh, council's consideration of the practical difficulty standard? The council tabled it at their last meeting uh, to further study the legalities because there's no case law for the practical difficulty. Um, and I have yet to understand what's going to happen now. Uh, I could, there will be a meeting, I assume. Yeah, I, I could elaborate. I did discuss with uh, the, the town manager, Mike McGovern, what the process would be. It was tabled, um, not to any definite time, but it was the intent, the stated intent at that council meeting that it would be soon addressed. And when I spoke with uh, the town manager, the, it's a matter of scheduling a town council workshop to uh, get a legal opinion from the town's attorney on the legal issues that were raised at the public hearing on March 15th and to then um, discuss it at a workshop and then to bring it back to the town council with a recommendation. Um, we will be uh, invited to be um, certainly it's an open meeting as well to to be part of that discussion but there were some some uh, scheduling difficulties I, I will make sure that board members are aware of it when it does happen it's it's certainly something this this is the kind of this is the kind of case that that, that shines the light on the difficulty of, of the zoning board of appeals look in in this community um, operating with with one set of regulations that are um, that if interpreted in a black and white way allow us to grant uh, very very few variances even when the intents and probably the effects would be beneficial um, at least by by some counts for the community but there there I'm, I'm sure the applicant uh, has has uh, been able to sense um, uh, the difficult position that that the board feels put in with this kind of an application. Um, however, it is it is our duty to um, render a judgment on it and to to move forward in in some way. And Mr. Keneally, perhaps like, would shed some light on that. Well, I'd like to make one comment that comes back to this issue. We're talking about uncertainty here on the where the where the right of way line really is, Bruce. Um, first house that I owned in Massachusetts was on a street with a curve in front of it. And in that case, I actually owned part of the paved area. So that's the other side of the coin for this case. I mean, it's, it's a possibility here that part of that paved area is actually within the envelope of the lot that these folks own. So, uh, I mean, I think that that's the big problem we're grappling with right here. We really don't know the degree, and it's possible there's no variance required at all. Because in the situation I was in, I actually owned about eight feet of pavement. But this defines as from the, the street, and this, the street is, is a defined term in the ordinance. Well, defined in what way? Defined in what way? Uh, the setback requirement references the street, right? On page 20, uh, 65 from local and private streets, and a street is can be private, public, or anything else. And if it's used as a street, then that is the setback uh, point. Yeah. In terms of defined terms, street is. But a setback is the shortest distance from the building to the nearest lot line or side line of a street right of way. So it's where the property right. line picks up. The lot line, yeah. 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 Um, Jack, Jack I, I, you may be getting, viewing what I'm saying in a, in a way that, that I'd like to clarify. It makes no difference what the outcome of, 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 the, of what you determine, the hard, whether the hardship is, is, is what I guess I'm trying to say, and very, doing a very bad job of it, is that the board should decide if that makes a difference on the measurements, if it if, if we're going to have if it's going to end up different because it's closer, 
and the hardship's going to change, the criteria is going to change, then so be it. I think the board owes the applicant, you know, that much to, so he can go away knowing that if he does a subdivision mm -hmm. uh, a review, a, a survey, that he has some chance of, of, of having his application approved. I well, mean, I, it's too bad to send him away, don't not address the not. issue, they come back this and is, but this is, this is why it's such a thorny issue, and I think Bob tried to sum it up, and I, I, I agree with what Bob just said, and that is that there have been cases in the past where there's been very, very small intrusions of a proposed structure onto of a setback, and um, basically winked at it in terms of whether the hardship exists. You know, if it's a one-foot kind of intrusion or something like that, we don't know what this is. It could be it could be no intrusion. It could be a ten-foot intrusion. But, but I do agree with you. If we operate by a black and white set of standards, that is what I'm saying. If the, if the majority of the board believes that the, the hardship criteria will change because it's closer, then you should the board as a whole should make that determination and move on. If it's not going to change, then they should review it based on what's before them. I think it boils down to that simple a matter. I Madam may be Chair. Wrong on this, but but, but Madam but Chair. Maybe, um, just, just one clarification, and, and then just a moment. It's, it's not just the hardship, it's the reasonable return that's been raised as, as another. Well, the hardship another is the hardship. Four criteria that so you're referring to generically. The okay. yeah. It boils down to, to that matter. Mr. Fristacci. I agree with Jack and I agree with Bob. I was prepared to vote favorably on this issue before I realized that it didn't appear as though the setback was 19 feet or 16 feet. It's a major concern. If it's, if it's 12 feet or 10 feet, I'll vote against it. But I think you have three votes to turn the other cheek, compliment the home buyer for what he's proposing and vote for it. If it's only a triangular piece, that's probably three feet out of the building envelope. But without the information, the proper information that would prove that there's only three feet, then I will go along with what Bruce is saying and say, let's talk about the hardship issue. I don't think there's a hardship here because the, per the property was just purchased. It did re uh, yield a reasonable return. But I would turn the other cheek because it is such a positive addition to the neighborhood. And I agree with what David said, and I agree with what, what you know, the points. This, this is not as easy as it appeared when we got the packet last week. But based on the information before me, I'm going to vote to, to deny the application, and I'll make a motion just to get this going. If there's information that comes back to us that shows that there's only three feet, then I would be the one that would, would sponsor Mr. Kramer to come back to us for a reconsideration. So to get this thing moving along, I will make a motion to deny the application uh, for a variance uh, for um, the property at um, whatever it is, Island, 21, 21 Island View Road. And, I, and I'm sorry because you spent a lot of work and it's a positive plan. But, but uh, we have a motion. Uh, we have I'll, a motion on the motion. floor, and now we, now we have a second. However, we we spoke before we voted up or down on a whole application that we would, and it's our town attorney's um, recommendation, strong recommendation that we take individual votes on each of the four conditions and whether it meets that. And I would like to. I I also want to clarify something before we take the vote. I made the motion. And, I, and I, I will reiterate what I said. If, in fact, you come back to, to, to us, and it is, you verify your dimensions, and it is this close, then I will, I, will re, I will reconsider my position. And I'm doing this only so that there's a window of opportunity for you to correct this issue. All right? Do you understand where I'm coming from? I want you to be honest. Or you can table it. You can request to table this right now. As a suggestion, I don't know if we can have discussion at this point. I'd, um, I'd say that um, under Robert's Rules of Orders, we can have discussion at this point. I say, as a suggestion, why not offer it to the applicant to see if he wants to vote for this or if he'd like to table this or withdraw 
or possibly table it and then come back next week or, or excuse me next month as a matter of precedent we have done that a number of times when there when the application has not been clear or something like that we have allowed the applicant to ask it to be tabled and then we voted on that so there isn't this one year wait to come back or we can do it Joe's way and people who voted against it can uh, uh, ask for reconsideration under Robert's rules of order either one it would I think would be equally equally effective but I would like to if you want to debate these issues then I, I would like to know the facts to debate to debate them you know the planning board the first thing it does when it gets a proposal is votes whether the application is complete or not and, and I, I think that's something we ought to consider doing because as far as I can see if you, ha if you if you have two different measurements you don't know what you're voting on then I mean the application isn't complete and shouldn't be shouldn't be before the board I think that that's where everyone is hung up is what is that distance from the corner of the porch to the street and if yeah. that were clarified for us it would make a difference in our ability to vote mm -hmm. either up or down for it um, there are several procedural ways that if if that is the feeling on the board that we could we could proceed and let's let's be clear about what they are we have on the table right now a motion to uh, deny this um, application um, that could be um, voted up or down or it could be withdrawn um, we could the applicant could request to table this until the next meeting this board could decide to table it until the next meeting the cleanest way is for the applicant to request it I believe from the way that we've <coughs> operated in the past uh, those are the options that I see if there are others that 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 people think um, would be ways for us to proceed but we you're right it has it has been done on this board um, several times in my tenure, and it certainly is legally permissible to, for an applicant to ask to table to bring back more full information. I had one quick question also. In the period of the year, if, if the applicant is denied on this occasion, the one-year period, does that extend to if the, if the plans are changed or altered? Does that set in forth a, a whole new motion? Or is that is off the books for a year? That's specified by the zoning ordinance. Yeah, on page uh, 47, um, paragraph B there at the bottom has the guidelines for that. Which reads, after a decision has been made by the board, a new appeal or application of similar import shall not be considered by the board until one year has elapsed following the date of such decision. The board may consider a new appeal or application within this one year period if it determines that owing to a mistake of law or misunderstanding of fact an injustice was done or that a change has taken place in some essential aspect of the case sufficient to warrant reconsideration. Any such new appeal or application shall be processed as a new request subject to the procedure set out above. We're still in the in the discussion phase. The um, the applicant perhaps would like to um, say, but you need to go to the microphone to do that. I would uh, respectfully like to have this table to the next um, meeting, and we will have the appropriate information uh, for you at that time by a licensed engineer. Said that's required. A formal report. It's up to the board. I, there's no problem. I mean, I, 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 hey, are there I'd be more than glad to withdraw my motion to deny this uh, variance if the second is willing in order to um, respect the applicant's wish to table this to the next meeting. Mr. Cronin? Yep, I'll second it. I'll go through my second. All right, based on that, then I would make a motion to table this to the next meeting so that Mr. Kramer has the opportunity to get a licensed surveyor to survey the property, determine the exact setback um, on that uh, on that front corner. A uh, point of information: uh, What kind of survey? Are we, we're not asking for a, a formal survey, right? Uh, what kind of survey did you propose? That I, I I haven't proposed. No, no. In, in, in times past, you said there's there's different kind of classes of surveys. There's a sketch plan that you can have sketch for plan. around 500 bucks. Yeah. 
We have a motion on the floor with no second yet. Is there a second? A second motion. All right. Now we can have the school of discussion as we'd like. I, perhaps I might, we've already had. I might bring, bring out the fact that, that if the measurements are less than that for, for, for the next agenda, there will be a tabled item and there will have to be a new application submitted for, for re-advertisement to all of butters uh, if, that, if the dimension is less. If it's more, then we can stick with what we got, but there will be two applications on the agenda. Which will affect, uh, which will mean that it will need to be done <coughs> very quickly in order to provide public notice so that this, in, in a timely way, for this to be taken up at the next meeting. It will be the same time frame as, as you would have between meetings. Right. I didn't understand fully what Bruce said. Could you the, say it the, again? The, 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 the application is, is for a variance of four feet mm -hmm. from the required 20. If the application or if the survey comes in at 15 feet, then that variance will have to be advertised at a <coughs> five foot variance instead of a four feet, which means it has to be a brand new application. We have to go through the process all over again of notification of all the butters, the legal ads, and, and the whole nine yards, which means it has to be a new application. If it's more than that, then we can use what we've got on the books already. And we, and we won't know that until the survey is completed. And that's, and you're right. That, that the it, notification it, it period the has to be, what, 10 pretty, days, pretty tight time before? frame. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. What, what is the notice period? What's the time frame? Well, the application has to be in two weeks prior to the, for, to the meeting. So if there's four weeks, it's got to be in in two weeks. What's the, what's the notice period to the adjoining or abutting landowners? How long? It's not a bonus period necessary to the abutting landowners. It's a notice that has to be appear in the paper seven days prior. Seven days? And we have to get it in seven days prior to that in order to get it to the newspaper to get it published. So it has to, a two-week window is a minimum we can run on. Does the proposed motion as it stands tie Mr. Kramer to next meeting, or can it be following meeting. It could, obviously, he has to coordinate with someone qualified to do the surveying as well. well table and go from meeting to meeting. Mm -hmm. It's table until somebody votes to take it off. Mm -hmm. Then we vote to take it off the table. Could you restate the motion, or did, could we have it read back to us? To, was it tabled to a date certain? Or I think I tabled to the next meeting. Um, I would amend that to uh, table it to allow Mr. Kramer an opportunity to uh, obtain a, a survey of the property to determine that exact setback from the, uh, from the front corner. Okay. I second the motion. Yeah. All right. Is there further discussion on the motion on the floor? Have we qualified as to what type of survey will be acceptable to us? You um, mentioned um, any, any survey that, that uh, will determine that setback. And if it's just a matter of get someone getting out there, determining it, he doesn't have to do the full-blown deal uh, just to determine what it, what it may be. A mortgage survey is, is sufficient if they know where that corner is. But it's just something by a, a licensed, registered engineer, and a, I mean surveyor. So you're saying a mortgage inspection will be sufficient? Well, if it determines what it is. But a, a, you could take the mortgage inspection that they've got and scale it out and come up with a measure. That's what you've done in the past. Is that, if that's what, you, you know, it doesn't make any difference to me. If that's, that isn't what I heard you before. I'd pay the $125 and get a new one done. Put the pin where the corner of that found it, where the, where the corner of the porch is going to be and then determine if that's 16 feet or, or 5 feet. Mr. Smith, is that clear to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what, what should be comfortable for the board. And if, if the board's comfortable with the mortgage inspection, that's... that's well, the mortgage inspections are the ones that caused all this trouble back, back in the 80s when, when uh, they started financing these properties and, uh, you know, finding problems with them. And believe and, me, we... And, pay, we and pay, this, we is, can, this is the only one that cares, is the bank. So if we have a mortgage survey done, it's going to satisfy a bank if and when he gets to sell the property. But it's spending all this money just buying it, he's not going to sell it for a while. Maybe they'll have something else that will cause problems. <laughs> but that's all I'm looking for is something so we don't see this back another 
five years when he sells the property and they've, they've got the proper document then all they need to scale, do is scale it out and put the measurement on it <coughs> there's a mortgage inspection in this back the only okay. difference is is they didn't transpose it onto that big plan like they should have done had they done that the, probably this discussion wouldn't have been taken place as far as the inaccuracies or I'm assuming that's the case I mean yeah uh, add something in here. We talked about this with the town attorney cases like this. Um, I don't want to cost the applicant any more time than absolutely necessary in whatever project he undertakes. Um, and I think we owe the applicant some sense of where the board stands. That's uh, what I've been saying for the last hour. Okay. So, I mean, I don't want <coughs> us to table it, invite the applicant to go out and spend more money on a survey, come back and say, these numbers are right, and still be defeated four to three. I mean, that's going to unnecessarily delay what the applicant wants to do with this house. And so I think we can take an informal uh, statement of sentiment of the board to give the applicant some feel of where we actually stand as a board. And it gets back to the issue, does the applicant meet eight, one, two, three, and four? That's the crux of this whole matter, Jack. I've said what I want to say. There, there has certainly been a, a mix of sentiments on this board, but there, there has been a lack of definition as to what degree of, of variance would need to be granted. Um, my sense of the board is that at least half of, of the board is is comfortable enough with this proposal to see to what degree it is. I, I think it would be misleading, though, to be and premature to be definitive without knowing the degree to which it is. I'll go on the hook and say and reiterate, I said I'd be comfortable with three to four feet, a triangular portion. Beyond that, I'm extremely uncomfortable. Is that what you wanted to hear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I'm extremely uncomfortable, and you know, it, it might have a hard time selling me. I mean, w once you say that, and then they realize, well, gee, it's really 18. Well, we can go do the whole thing out another two feet, and you give them a variance. Uh, they can do a major reconstruction of the house if the variance is uh, is four feet, when really two is needed on this, and then you can rethink the whole project. Not that I think the applications the applicant thinks that, but I think we owe it to the. Uh, uh, to the town and the abutters to know what we're, what we're signing off on. I'll, I'll, I'll be more frank and maybe more controversial in that I continue to be troubled um, by, by the number one and number four conditions and whether this would, whether this would meet it. And, um, and I, would, I would have to, to be convinced that I could feel comfortable approving this kind of a variance, it would have to be a minuscule um, far less than what you're suggesting for me to feel comfortable with that. Um, but I, I would like to stay open-minded until I saw it. Can I ask a question? Why are you uncomfortable with number four? The, the hardship is not an action taken by a... Is, in these cases, usually it's, 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 a, it's an increase in the setback requirements that creates the hardship. So I'm not sure that's I'm, an action. I'm not convinced that an aesthetic, um, much, much as I love the, the aesthetic goals of this project, that that, that um, is a hardship. Okay, I, I thought you were referring specifically to, to, to criteria number four on the hardship, on the variance. So. Okay. And, and I'm certainly not, not convinced at all by, by the reasonable return um, rule. Um, for both of those, um, I am also persuaded by the court decision um, for pertaining to hardship, which says that if the applicant purchased the home recently and knows of them and had knowledge, it implies that they had knowledge of the setback at the time of purchase. And unfortunately, in this case, we did purchase the home only a couple months ago. And so I, I assume that the, the setback variance was in apply, in, applied to then, applies now. And unfortunately, he had to have known about it at the time he purchased it just a couple months ago. I believe we had a, a court case cited in out of the uh, two lights road case where they said that that wasn't either the land it didn't make a difference if it was just purchased a person could, could not create their own hardship that either either the land had a hardship or it didn't 
and, and the fact that it was purchased was, was not relevant. I don't well, I think, I think you're right. There, there is a subsequent decision which then amended the previous decision, and, but it said that it's not, purchase of it is not the only hardship factor when combined with other things. And right. That combined with it, as Anne said, was the reasonable return to right. me is persuasive. Yeah, well, the reasonable return criteria is a very, very difficult criteria to meet. I mean, uh, 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 in, in the Booth Bay case, uh, uh, a guy's home was washed away, and uh, the court said well, he, uh, he couldn't rebuild because of setbacks, and, and the court ruled that uh, uh, he could put a trailer on there for the summer, a temporary structure, and that constituted a reasonable return. So that's a very difficult criteria to meet for any kind of structure, given the way the courts have ruled. Mr. Becker. I'd like to make it clear that I am fully in favor of the addition that Mr. Kramer wants to put onto his house. Um, my concern is that if we, as the Zoning Board of Appeals, say, well, we'll ignore the ordinance for a three-foot intrusion or four feet or three feet six inches or whatever line we want to draw in our own mind, that we're sending the wrong message to the town council. I want to send a message to the town council that they need to change this ordinance. Um, this is ridiculous for us as a board to have to be debating whether or not this addition that you want to put on your home, Mr. Kramer, is a benefit to yourself and your neighborhood. It clearly is. Um, the town council should change the ordinance to permit us to apply the practical difficulty test, which would permit us all to very easily say, this is great, go ahead with our blessings, here's your variance. But instead we have to struggle with this, and if the town council says, well, no, let's stick with the undue hardship test because the Zoning Board of Appeals is doing a pretty good job of ignoring it. policing <laughs> it and ignoring it in the right cases and you know, granting it anyway, that would be a bad result. Um, I want you to go to the town council and say, the Zoning Board of Appeals denied my request to improve my home and every one of my neighbors are in favor of it. This is a good case, a good reason for you, town council, to change the ordinance. What are you waiting for? I'm in favor of this, but I'm not inclined to vote in favor of it um, for the reasons that I've stated but I want you to get your addition. <coughs> Can I second what you just said? <laughs> I think and I, and I, yeah. mm -hmm. I haven't said anything about the beauty of the projects. I'm, I'm looking at the law, um, and it, is a, it will be a, an enhancement to your property and as well as fitting in with the neighborhood nicely. So it, it would be nice to see this be completed, but unfortunately the, the black letter law that I'm looking at isn't letting me give you the green light. And I'd like to bring up something that I probably figure is inappropriate, but on the same line that, that, that I can tell you that there are a number of people watching this meeting and the outcome, and there are a number of people that would want to, wants to go before this board for variances, but they're waiting because they know that the practical difficulty may be a reality, and they'd rather go that way. I guess I would suggest if they're watching this meeting and they have an interest in that, they could call their town councilor. They have called. They have, they have done that. They have called the, the town manager. But, uh, and, and, I, yeah. and then this may be appropriate. It's not an appropriate discussion, but since you brought it up, <laughs> there are issues besides that. Well, uh, besides you know, what I was getting to, I wanted the applicant to have the benefit of knowing where the board stands. I would guess it's likely, even if you come back with a formal survey that says the numbers are exactly as they are here, you'll probably get turned down. So I think you should go forward in whatever direction you want with that knowledge. Well, there's really not a lot I can do. I mean, I'm at the mercy of the, the board, I'm at the mercy of the town council, I'm at the mercy of a potentially changing law in the middle of a, an issue that uh, I'm, I was unaware of and not clear of. I'm, yeah. I, I spend half my time in California and I'm here, I'm here this week and I, have to tell you that I'm a bit amazed at the process. I've never been through something as so grueling as this for an addition, <laughs> to be very frank with you. Uh, we work a little quicker out in California. Um, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate your positions, and I understand that you're in a, in a, in a difficult uh, position here. I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to work with the board, the town, the city, the community to make this happen. 
I can only do what we did. Uh, Tony, like I said, put together a, a, a marvelous presentation. We've, we've done our application. I can take suggestions. I'd like to move forward with the project as soon as possible. It, it, you know, it's not a life or death situation for me right now, but we'd like to, you know, it's, this limited amount of good weather to do construction like this, and we were hoping we could start in May or June. If we can't, we can't. Um, I don't see any real clear path for me at this point, which is a bit disturbing. Um, so I, I, I really don't know what to say or what to comment or what to do at this point. Um, the intent here is to, as you've seen, beautify, put people to work, put money into the community. I mean, this is going to be a, you know, a six-figure project at least. And I, I think it's a shame that I can't move forward and, and, and spend my money here. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad comment, especially when it's a, it, to, for a benefit of everybody and, and, and the neighborhood. Uh, but I, you know, I believe in the rule of law, and I believe in, in the, the board and the council's authority and, and the town council, and I'm going to abide whatever, play by the rules. But obviously, something needs to change here because this is a, a bit of out of balance, and I think uh, I really don't know what else to do at this point. I mean, well, we we do have a, a motion on the table, which is which is to table this, um, and and you would have the option then to um, to come back with a, a surveyor's um, with with the numbers that would. Which I'd be willing to would do, lead to further discussion, um, but you understand the complexity of, that's been laid out very clearly here, um, and this issue does go far beyond your your one property, as Apparently. as has been said, and it's it's certainly why um, it's it's important that in in our society we have op open meetings that are now televised, that that the public um, has as much a stake in this as any of us or, or you and that it's an important issue for this community to decide how much flexibility there will be in, in the zoning requirements that are upheld and enforced. And that's, that's really a core um, decision that the town council will need to be making in the very near future. And I, and I appreciate that. And my experience in, in the law and so forth is reasonableness, and there is discretion, and, and we refer to it as discretionary justice and reasonableness. And, um, whatever uh, reasonableness can uh, be applied in this uh, situation, um, I certainly would appreciate. Uh, and I thank you for your, your time. Uh, I didn't realize it was going to go uh, be as lengthy as this. I was uh, a bit surprised, but we do I do have appreciate a, We do have a, a motion on the floor, and before we vote, there's still an opportunity well, for discussion. One, one thing I'd like to say before, I, I think for both sides, we need to be fair in what our expectations are going to be if this comes before the board again. And I think, and I think we're in agreement there, is that we need to have that part of the equation plugged in as to what the distance is from the corner of that porch to the street. And then the entire application will be entirely reviewed once again. Um, I don't think it all hinges on what's that distance, but it just need, we need that part of the equation plugged in. Mm -hmm. I think the, mm -hmm. the applicant should know that if he comes back with an application identical to this, I would say the chances are that the application would be denied. And your best chance is you may find that the actual lot line intrudes on the pavement. There was some possibility of that. I don't know. Well, and I, I, yeah, I, I find that a bit. As a point of face check, I don't think that's relevant because it, the setback is defined from the street. It doesn't make any difference where his lot no, line is. It's defined to the lot line. Yes. What? It's defined to the lot line. It's we just went through that. The setback references the street. Street right of way was the, the phrase right that of way. was read. And it doesn't, it, 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 he could have, he could own part of the street, but that's irrelevant. Well, no. If the street's right of way is actually someplace in the middle of the pavement, then it is very relevant. Uh, I don't think so, I, the, the, the way the, the ordinance reads. Because the street can be, a, it can be private property, it can be a street. I, I would certainly say that if we decide to table this until the next meeting, we need some clarification on the on the legal definition of, of where that line is drawn from. It's a property line. If the property line happens to be into the pavement, then the, probably the paved right of way has been shifted. Um, whether there's the legal rights for the, for the town to have adverse possession on that is not an answer that I could get 
relevant to any particular case. That would be something that have to be settled above and beyond this board. Yeah, there have been other cases where this, where I mean, this has come the, up. They'll establish the property line regardless of whether there's, whether there's a sidewalk or grass or pavement. And that's the property line is the property line. And that's what that's where the line is drawn from. That's what we go by. The other comment I would want to make to the applicant is I, if the town council does act on this, I don't think it's going to happen within the next month or maybe even the next two months. It's probably a few months away if it happens at all. So you want to factor that into your own planning. Well, I, I, and again, I'm, I'm willing to bring back the figures from a, a mortgage survey. Uh, Tony would be willing to come next month. I won't be in the area. I'll be, um, I'll be in California next uh, next month at this time. Um, and if he, you're willing to uh, accept the results of that, uh, well, if it if it's determined that you know the setback is miserably tight and it's worse than what we we think, then I I don't know that we we'll, we'll take that. Uh, Take that information and uh, let you know whether we're going to represent. But if it's either the same or in my favor that I own half the street, then we'll come back in and we'll make that presentation or Tony will present that information. I mean, we pretty much, I don't think we re have to re redo all this and then you can discuss the merits of uh, moving forward based on the information. Um, uh, of the actual setback, and I, I'm willing to do that. Mr. Smith? Well, I'm a little concerned that we already have a mortgage inspection plan that, if scaled out, would show less than this. Are we going to look for another mortgage inspection plan so that we have two on file that contradict each other? Uh, that's compromising the board's position in itself. Um, I think that's something you should consider. That's the point I was trying to make earlier, is I think I would prefer something a little bit more significant than the mortgage. And, and that's why it goes back to the same issue. If you need something that's accurate, you really ought to decide whether the applicant is going to meet the, the criteria rather than put him through an expense that, 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 that may be fruitless. Madam Chair, you have a motion on the floor at the suggestion of the applicant. Uh, the motion is to table, and uh, I'd like to move the question. All right. Any objections to moving the question? All those in favor of the motion to table, say aye. 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 The vote is seven to zero. The motion has been tabled. Thank you. So what, could I have a point of clarification from the board, what am I going to accept for a plan? Am I going to accept a mortgage inspection plan that's different than this one and have both of them in the record that's different? I, I, I need some clarification here. I, I guess I think that the applicant really can't be required to provide anything more than a mortgage inspection plan, but he might be well served by getting a more rigorous survey done. But the applicant has asked for a four foot, and according to that, he only needs two. So then why would we vote for a four foot uh, 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 variance when, according to that, he only needs two feet setback? Where does he know only need two feet? Well, if, if that's 18 feet from the road and the minimum setback. No, 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 no. If you look at this, this is 18, this is 19. That's 20 and 19. You know at this point he is going to be closer than 16 feet from this mortgage inspection plan. It's going to be closer than this. There's no way around that. If you take and scale that out, right. it's going to bend up close. That's right. Period. Okay. So that mortgage inspection plan is going to do no good for him. Well, that's why I was trying to communicate the board's sentiment to the applicant that if he comes back with that, <coughs> he's likely going to be denied. And so. Well, I, I don't think, you, and I shouldn't dwell on this, I don't think you're doing justice as far as telling him what he really needs you guys to review this. If you want to review it with some other document, I think you really need to 
You, sh you should be fair to them and, and be pacific. Well, it's, it's, it, it's clear that the best chance that the applicant has is to, is to get the most specific information that he can that's in, in his best fa favor. Um, and there are several, several kinds of information that he could get. He could pay for an all-out survey. That would be his option. He has several other options that would be somewhat less than that. I mean, I personally, I'll tell you, I'm not going to vote for a variance to allow him to build a porch. The small part, the entryway, I might vote for. But to build an entire porch with, with four feet closer to the road, uh, I'm not inclined to vote for. Bruce, excuse me. In my profession, I've had need of a surveyor a number of times to determine the distance or to locate pins. And the price has been somewhere under $200 to do that. It hasn't been a full-blown survey. I don't think that's required here. My concern at quarter past seven was what is that exact distance from that corner of the, the porch to the right of way? That, to determine that, would cost somewhere between $100 and $200. And okay. that is what I would be comfortable with. And I think the board also would be comfortable with. That's what uh, I we don't have to do a full-blown survey. My suggestion to the applicant would be to scale it out with what the information you have. If it looks like it's less than four feet, then you might want to verify that. If it's more than four feet, I think you've heard the sentiment of the board that you probably won't have a snowball's chance in July, okay, uh, to be more specific. And I think that's what you're asking us to do. You got a sense of, of, of our feelings, and the only other thing you could do is to wait to hope that the council will change the, the guidelines that we use and come back in a, in a few months when it's changed. And you know, if you're in California, you probably don't need to make these changes right now. But that's what I'm looking for, Bruce, is, is uh, something of that I nature. That's wanted, all I wanted the board to express yeah. to the applicant. I don't think he has to spend a lot of so. money to do it. I really don't. I think if the mortgage survey that we have had at the dimension that we're looking for, we probably could consider it tonight. The survey just happens to not include that, that corner place. dimension, and therefore we're not. Well, and that's when the applicant came came in, or, or the representative came in. I told him we needed a, a mortgage inspection plan to establish the distances. I was amiss in comparing the mortgage inspection plan with the site plan that was done, and I think a lot of this could have been avoided if if the, if the two matched or if I had been able to catch that situation. Right. And I would, would ask any board member that if they see that ahead of time, if I miss it, and I apologize for missing it, that please give me a call. I could address it with the applicant and we might be able to come up with some measurements so we don't have this issue before us. We may not be able to hear it because I might have advertised based on, on, a, on the site plan that may be more, but at least we would know the applicant could ask for table and we wouldn't have had to sit here for two hours or three hours trying to figure out what the applicant needed. Thank you. Okay, I think we've, I think everyone is, is clear on how things will go for the, the future, and that concludes the new business portion of our meetings. There are a few communications. Um, one is that I wanted to point out to board members that you've each received this book, um, which is a publication of the Maine Municipal Association, and it's a Board of Appeals manual. It's for your reference. It uh, uh, undoubtedly could shed some light on some of these, um, some of these very complex kinds of decisions that we're needing to interpret, and I'd encourage you to review it. And, um, and if there, if there is a desire in the future, if there are legal points or legal case reviews that we need additional um, information from, from town council, we can certainly um, request that. Uh, the second yeah, uh, set of uh, communication. Can I just make a comment on that? Uh, as I understand, we're not allowed to ask the town council what it meant when it passed us an ordinance. I was faced this before. We were having trouble interpreting the ordinance, and I said, well, let's ask them. And our attorney said, no, you can't do that. You must deal with the law as written. 
We, that's right. Yeah. Um, the law is written in the case law that supports it. Yeah. And we can ask for background on that. We can't discuss um, in a workshop setting um, specific cases or, or decisions that were made about our specific cases, but we can discuss case law that supports decision making. Mm -hmm. um, the other communications that you've received are some zoning bulletin, um, special supplements, and, and some other it's pieces. It's educational. Um, for us, and it will be shared with us as it comes into the code enforcement officer, as he becomes aware of these things that will help broaden our our information on what other zoning boards of appeals are doing across the state. We will be um, sharing these. And the the third piece of communication that I wanted to share with you yeah, has already been shared, but in this section, I will just note that. Uh, the secretary and the and the chair of the board, uh, Mr. Keneally and myself, were at the meeting of the town council on March 15th, along with Hank Warren, the, the uh, former chair of the zoning board of appeals, and the uh, the issues were raised about the um, legal soundness of us uh, of the town council changing to the practical difficulty um, language, and that uh, it was. Uh, very open to um, appeal, and that uh, I believe it was said um, at one point that there had been no other um, towns in the state that had adopted it, although it was refuted as well that there had been a few that had adopted similar language. Um, the um, town council hearing hearing that information um, really raised uh, had had questions about it, and the town attorney was not in in attendance at the meeting. And it was really felt that there needed to be more legal opinion um, discussed um, before the town council could could make a judgment. It is in the hands of the town council now. It is not in the hands of the zoning board of appeals. But it is it is very clear that we need to be engaged in that discussion, and that people in the community that are concerned about um, about our zoning ordinance need to be engaged in that discussion as well. Um, it's, it's not clear to me that, uh, that there is any one champion of, of this um, change. And uh, I think that we, I, w I would correctly say that we need more information and there needs to be a review and an education on this, on this issue with the town council members for us all to be very clear as a town about what, what the dilemmas are that are faced by this board um, by um, similar cases to, to what we've been discussing tonight. But also, there are other sides to the argument about opening up the flexibility too much that, that really deserve to be fully looked at. Um, I will say on a, on a personal note that sometimes the democratic process doesn't always operate in as logical and orderly a, a fashion as one might hope for in decision making in that our board made this recommendation over a year ago and the planning board looked at it and made some suggestions and, and was in support of it um, almost a year ago and the town council looked at it and the town council workshop was supportive of it at the time when it went to town council. But new public testimony came in that raised new questions. And, and so it's, it's not an even process for, for making change. And I think it, it's beholden on us, as well as other members of the public, to take a, a, a new look at it, um, to look at all the issues that have been raised. I did take the liberty to um, poll some southern Maine towns. Um, not all of them, but I do have some data based on approximately 20 towns, there are seven that have adopted practical difficulty standards. And I have that, and I will get that in a form, format whereby you all understand it uh, so that you can, you know, bring that forth if need be. South Portland, Portland, Brunswick, Standish, and I can't remember, there's three other ones. So we do have a couple of neighbors that are using it. Cumberland is one. Cumberland. Although this isn't unique because if you're a resident, you can go by the practical difficulty standards, but if you're a non-resident, you have to go by the other. I speak from personal experience. <laughs> well, when, when they say other people haven't adopted it, they, they have, or 
There are also, but there are also some towns that have adopted a combination, so that well, South we Fulton has adopted both, but every town has to still maintain the hardship criteria that's currently on the books for shoreland zoning. You don't have a choice; you can't adopt practical difficulty for shoreland. So that will be and I still be on our books for that particular right. For shoreline. Right. I, I think the point that um, there was a member of the public who was an attorney who spoke at that town council meeting. I think the point that he made that was most persuasive to the council was that no town had adopted the practical difficulty standard as a substitute for the hardship standard. There have been. There has been. So, out of that so, seven, at so, least five of them have been. Have, have, so have, from have, what you have found out, the town council has perhaps inadvertently been misled by the attorney who spoke before them, which is, I think, a very important piece of information. And of course there isn't case law if it's brand new. I mean, that, that's an argument that somebody can make. We don't want to go into something with no case law, but right. um, every time you pass new, new laws, you, the case law comes after. Right. Are there any other communications that, that people would like to bring forward at this time? Um, there being none, I declare this meeting adjourned. And thank you all for, for bringing all of your minds to this. Good job, Madam Chair. <laughs> no, it's just